when you are in those states, those states are not only okay. do they feel real, they are as real as any other state because you have no other way of evaluating the realness of any state besides your own perspective. And when you start changing your perspective, that perspective is as real as any perspective you could ever have. Like I'd almost compare it to like, so you like you dump everything instead of being, instead of something being like kind of like a way to free yourself from maybe some prior prescription. Instead, you've like locked yourself in this whole new prison where you're not allowed to have any of the same things that you had in your last room. We lost a lot of the rituals that kind of went along with religious ceremony. So like rites of passage, when you turn a certain age, uh, community gatherings every single weekend, um, doing charity with like groups of people that are like-minded, um, you know, ways to meet strangers and make friends and come together and talk about like how we should live in society. Like, I think that all of those things are fine. Um, I just don't like the religious part of it, the theological part of it. But um, when we got rid of like, like when people became like a religious and started to lose that we like completely abdicated all those other things as well which i think was probably to the detriment of society i, I think you said you've taken shrooms right mm -hmm. and for a lot of people that's quite a big thing like it's it, some for some people that's a life-changing thing do you think it was really like it did anything particularly big for you um yeah i think that the perspectives i think that you can gain from like psychedelic drugs are pretty unique like i don't know if you can get those in or have like experiences that are quite like that, so. But I mean like what you get out of it is what you put into it, so. It's also possible to do stuff like that and like get nothing out of it, so. Mm -hmm. How, how, how does it change perspective though? Um. The, so the difficulty of the question is like, it's kind of like, if a colorblind person asked you to describe what colors looked like, it would be like describing that. It's really, really, really hard to do. Um, because everything, because everything that you get via those kinds of drugs is experiential. I think that's a word. Like things that you experience. It's not like, um, oh, when I did uh, mushrooms, I thought about all these cool things about my life, and that I was one with the world or whatever. It's more like the kind of the feelings that you get. Um, I would say for like really high doses of psychedelics, like um, one of the things that's really cool or really scary, I guess, is um, there are. There's a lot happening to give you your day-to-day -day experience or like um, to use computer analogies, right? Like you're running like an operating system in your brain, but there's like a whole bunch of different parts that are involved in making that work. And mm -hmm. the if you take enough of like certain types of drugs, when you start to break those parts down, but something is still there that's not quite you, but you could like observe like what's left um, and a lot of like the processing for things like the passage of time or things like, you know, your short term memory or like the sensory experiences you have, like the way colors and sounds look and the way that it affects your mood and something that's left that's like a mood, but not quite your mood. Um, like being able to observe all of that and then to come back into sobriety when you're done is like a very interesting experience. Like nothing really quite compares with like, I can't really think of any other ways like that to like strip yourself down so much and then see what's left and then observe that and experience that and then come back to, to like being normal again, I guess. Mm. That's really interesting. Have yeah. you ever heard of the- Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Have you ever heard of the God helmet? The God helmet? No, I've heard of a lot of different types of things, perspective machines and experience machines, but never the God helmet. What is the God helmet? So it kind of strobes electrical impulses to your temporal lobe, which can induce a feeling that you're being observed by a greater presence. Mm -hmm. Some people have a religious experience as a result. Some people it induces um, an alien experience, like they're being abducted by aliens. For some, they see ghosts. For some, they see demons. But most unanimously have this feeling that an otherworldly presence is observing them. Um, some people have come away believing in God as a result of wearing the God helmet. Mm -hmm. and. Others have had really traumatic experiences that have made them convinced there is no God. But, you know, it can pretty consistently, just through a physiological response, a neurological response, induces the feeling of touching a greater presence than oneself. Mm -hmm. And the subjectivity of that, um, and the cultural implications of that, like, depending on what culture, it, it changes how you interpret, it, interpret that sensation and what you see. Um, so like those sorts of things say to me that, um, if I were trying to understand religious experiences from my perspective as someone who wasn't raised with religion, who's had no organic religious experiences, mm -hmm. it makes it really hard for me to believe in a God. Because if you, 
because how can you tell the difference between a neurological thing like that happening, a neurological event, and an actual being touched by God, if both feel exactly the same. If you can just zap the temporal lobes enough and suddenly you see God, mm -hmm. or a ghost, or whatever your culture interprets that sensation as, mm -hmm. it makes it profoundly more difficult to understand what a religious experience genuinely would be, or how to prove that it's real and not For sure. just a neurochemical event. So, so or go ahead. No, I was just wondering what you thought of that. So something that is very interesting to me is that when we talk about whatever state we're in, it's usually while we're in that state. And something that I observed on sufficiently high levels of drugs is that Kind of this to me this was scary a lot of people find it comforting there's a lot there's a whole battery of different experiences you can have something that um psychedelic drugs really reinforce to me is that reality is absolutely constructed in the brain um everything in reality is constructed in the brain so everything you see everything you taste touch feel everything is like your, your brain has to put together some picture of that and then whoever you are like whatever you're moving through however you move your body like everything all of this is something like a story that your brain is telling yourself. Um, that's really easy to um, cognitively think about. Like I'd always figured that for maybe like 15 years. Like I've cognitively thought that, but I think it's a whole other thing to really feel that. Um, because the feeling of that, um, when you come back for a while after a big trip, um, reality feels very queer. And that like uncomfortable feeling of not knowing if like, this place is real or the place that I just came from is real is one of the things that it's like made me temper back kind of my criticisms of like religious people um, because it's very easy right now as I talk to you like okay well obviously this is the real reality I'm not under the influence of any drugs oh well like you know if you could zap your brain and have a temporal experience you know whatever but when you go to those other states if you do something to like shift your um, perspective either a drug or some zaps to the brain when you are in those states those states are not only okay. do they feel real, they are as real as any other state because you have no other way of evaluating the realness of any state besides your own perspective. And when you start changing your perspective, that perspective is as real as any perspective you could ever have. Like I'd almost compare it to like a dream. Like when you're in a dream, you know, unless you're doing like, unless you're like, I guess a lucky like lucid dreamer or something, um, you don't really know 100% you're in a dream unless you start comparing it to your current reality. Um, and when you do like sufficiently high levels of drugs, or I imagine when you get zapped by that helmet, whatever state you're in at that point is as real as anything it's ever been in your entire life. Like you can't be in that state and be like, okay, well, I know that this is fake, LOL, and I'm gonna go back to normal. It could be that that's the real state, and then this is the one that you, um, you know, like once your brain doesn't have what it needs to realize what's real, it comes back to this place. You know, there's no real way to evaluate one or the other, I think is an uncomfortable feeling for me at least. But. It's hard because, like, I am a lucid dreamer. Mm -hmm. I find it very, very difficult to become convinced that a dream is real. I usually, within seconds, realize I'm dreaming. Um, it, even when I have nightmares, I still know that they're not real. Mm -hmm. And that's not what's intimidating about them at all. And that's why I haven't had nightmares since I was a kid. Yeah. Because it's, it's very difficult to become intimidated by something you know can't actually affect you. Mm -hmm. Um. And this is coming from someone who has such vivid dreams. I can taste everything. I feel yeah. pain. Dreams I'm also. exactly the same way. I can have very vivid dreams, but I've always lucid dreamed. Uh, something that's like kind of punny is that, um, I don't know if you have ways, but if, if I feel like I'm dreaming, which usually happens when something is like really wrong, I usually do things to test. Like I'll ask somebody a question or I'll like, try to like fly or break something. And it's like, okay, this is clearly a dream. Like it doesn't work. Um, when I was coming out of like really big mushroom trips, I the very first one I did, I employed a lot of those same tricks because I wasn't convinced that like I was back in the real world yet. Um, but yeah, I understand that feeling of like lucid dreaming all the time. And so like, I, I very presently have like a concept of reality, like a point of reference for like what I think is real. Mm -hmm. But like, I, I, don't I don't trust my own perception um, because I know that I'm very uh, vulnerable to bias and distortion and um, so like I know that the human brain is a very flawed thing to use to understand and interpret the world mm -hmm. so the way that I uh, reason is that I'll take a little bit of t time to gather data and other perspectives and measurements um, 
and that's how I come to the best possible conclusion and I'll acknowledge where there's gaps in that and go until we can possibly know more this is what we presently understand this is what we're working with like wherever there can't be any certainty mm -hmm. so I, I I don't know it's it's very difficult to me for me to wrap my head around the idea that everything is just as real as you perceive it to be like everything we experience is just like all concepts of reality are just a uh, or like equally valid that seems really silly it's it's hard for me to comprehend things from that perspective mm -hmm. even though like some degree I, I kind of realize that it might be quite arrogant to believe that there's an absolute truth um, at the same time I feel like data is how I understand the world so like for example zodiacs some people really, really believe in zodiac signs and go like really put a lot of value and how compatible they are with another person or like how they should behave month to month or whatever based on the planet's alignments and what like, I don't know, a certain page of a newspaper tells them. Whereas I will go, okay, so of all the people who interpret this data that comes from the stars, how many of them unanimously read those positionings and come to the same conclusion? None mm -hmm. of them? Where does the validity come from? And so that has nothing to do with what I want to believe, has nothing to do with my own interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking for like a pattern, something that's relatively consistent that would indicate that something is unanimously true. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there are those sorts of points of reference that kind of go beyond our own perceptions and are sometimes more reliable than them. I understand what you're saying. I completely disagree, but in terms of this world, um, I absolutely think that there are like, assuming you're operating from some sound, like epistemic foundation, like your way of divining truth, like has some consistent basis, like some logical foundation, then like, I think that you can rule like, okay, this is silly, this isn't silly. So like when you look at zodiac signs and the fact that five different people can give you five different interpretations for the same sign in the same day or whatever, like obviously something is broken or dumb here. Um, I would say that having like the really big dissociative experiences are a little bit different because you, those mental faculty don't really exist in the same ways in those worlds. It's really hard to explain it. It sounds really pretentious. I don't like talking about it, um, but like, um, I, I, like, I will say that like I was the most like uh, I would describe myself as like a materialist slash physicalist. Like I very much believe only in the material physical world, no dualism, no spirituality, none of that shit. Um, and I hardcore felt that way going into that the very first like really big trip I did, and then coming out of it, I feel like I stand on much more shaky ground when it comes to like understanding my relationship with the world. Um, I know that there are things that exist like rationality and consistency and all of these things. Uh, but I guess the thing that I've tried to understand is that all of those things come after your perspective. So like you have a, a subjective experience that exists. And then from that subjective experience, you understand things like rationality or even like objective logics, you know, propositional logic and all of that. But that all of that necessarily comes after the, um, the subjective experience you have. And there's like no way to escape that uh, rationale. Or, or not rational, there's no way to escape your own kind of like conscious experience. Um, one of the things, one of the kind of thought things that has moved me away a little bit from like the, the purely physicalist world, um, I inadvertently stumbled onto this in a vegan debate, but something that I realized is um, if there is a conscious experience somewhere, you actually have absolutely no way of observing it. But we all think that they're real. We, at least we have our own experience and we assume that everybody else has their experience, but like I can lay out like a sufficiently complex thing of organs that communicate with each other or circuitry, but if I were ever to ask you, like, is there a conscious experience here? All you can really do are like try to ask, like figure it out by proxy. Like, well, does it respond? Does it talk like me? Does it have emotions? But you can't actually observe it using any of the organs that we have to detect like anything out there, anything in the outside world. Um, so I think like that idea going along with the idea that like I can't step out of my perspective, like makes me a little bit more, I, I try to couch my language a little bit more carefully like into these other terms rather than saying like, I have like objective rationale that I can use to give me an objective perspective on what things are true or not true. I try to be a little bit more careful, uh, I guess, when I talk about those things. And... Yeah, that's totally understandable. I kind of feel like I have no proof that what I'm interpreting is reliably other consciousness that I'm sharing the world with. For mm -hmm. all I know, this is like a simulation and I'm the only conscious being and everyone else is an AI. Yeah. But the, the reason why I remain vegan, despite that being a possibility, is because I think all I can do is go on the data I am being provided with and 
if I were to, it would be far more devastating to behave selfishly under the understanding, well, maybe everything's not real and maybe it doesn't matter if I hurt anyone. And then t it turned out that I have hurt a fuck ton of people, mm -hmm. then vice versa. Oh so yeah, we have we talked about that. this before, like this is like a form of Pascal's Wager kind of. Mm. Where like, um, Pascal's Wager, it's usually used for religious arguments, but it's like if if there is no God and you live your life like there isn't one, then you're then you're fine, I guess. But if there is a God and you live your life like there isn't one, you're like in eternal hell and damnation, so you might as well live like there is one. Um, and you can apply like that type of wager to other situations as well. Like maybe everything is fake, but if it isn't and you fuck everything up, then you're like pretty fucked, yeah? Yeah. But the way that I interpret it in relation to gods is that, like, there are so many different gods that we've, we've, we, like, there are huge percentages of the human population that believe that many different gods exist. Mm -hmm. There is no way to reliably ascertain which one is real. So if there's a god up there that's like, you have to believe me or I'll send you to hell, but I'm not going to let you know that I'm more real than any of the other gods in other books that are equally as valid and convincing as my book, mm -hmm. then I'm kind of comfortable not believing in that god, and I'm like, fine, whatever, because you don't seem very reasonable anyway, and spending eternity t with you sounds like hell, mm -hmm. so I'd rather live on my own terms and be wrong than live by your terms when they're that immature. Like, an example is, if you need constant reassurance that you're awesome all the time, you're a bit needy and I don't want to worship you. Mm-hmm. So, I wouldn't apply Pascal's wager to um, to gods, mm -hmm. but I feel like inadvertently causing harm to innocent people who are just trying to live their lives seems far more devastating to me than not massaging the ego on a daily basis of someone who made me but gave me no clue that they exist before they decided to punish me for not knowing they exist. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I like, mean, I understand. I think it's. I think most people. I think most rational people pro feel pretty similar. Like as long as you live like a decent kind of life, like why would you have to play like a giant like jigsaw puzzle game in real life to figure out like some spooky guy exists? It's pretty dumb. Yeah. yeah, and to be honest, that isn't me saying that none of these gods exist. It's me saying that perhaps the way that we interpret them on a mass scale might be incredibly flawed to the point where it's it's very difficult to use any of that like information in any of those books to comprehend the idea of that sort of deity mm -hmm. so like if if it turns out that there is a god i think i would interpret different data and take that on board as a result of different data than the current ones being laid out um to pressure people to believe in a god sure. I, I think there's a difference between um the likelihood that there is a god and the historical human interpretation of gods. I think human interpretation of dog gods is incredibly unreliable and distorted, self-serving and um, irrational compared to like the concept of a god or a creator in and of itself. Um, like to the point where like people will choose to read prejudices and justify control and cruelty from those things. Uh, and that doesn't seem as rational. And that's not like a specific religion thing. Like, that's not me saying like Christians are too irrational to believe. That's me saying like when looking for data regarding whether or not I want to believe there's a creator and things like that, I think it's, it's better to um, look first for quantifiable data than to start with historical textbooks because historical textbooks, historically, there's a lot of evidence, um, have like people pressuring each other to interpret it in a way that involves prejudice and cruelty and political maneuvering. That doesn't necessarily weigh in on the books themselves so much as how people pressure you to interpret the books themselves. Mm -hmm. Sure. So like with all of that surrounding it, it doesn't seem very safe, especially with human biases, to rely on that alone when interpreting the nature of the universe. Wait, say that last part again. Wait, hello? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> oh wait, say, can you repeat that last part? Sorry, I, for some reason I didn't hear the last part. So... It's not to say that they're naturally inherently invalid, but to, to, I feel like... Sorry, I'm trying to remember what I said. <laughs> like, um, 
it's not inherently like saying those books are wrong, but、uh-huh. it's saying that like it's not entirely safe or reliable to re- to look to those first when accumulating data on the understanding of the universe. Oh sure, because, okay, yeah, 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 because like the way I see it is. Religion on its own can be a really awesome excuse to do good or bad. I see religion more as a mirror.、Mm-hmm. So, like when you look at a holy book, there are excuses in every holy book to do good and to do bad. So,、sure. I don't think religion is inherently good or bad. I think it's a mirror. You can look for excuses to do good or bad in it, so it really just reflects you. That's who, what you find in a, a holy book. You don't find、um, necessarily. As many answers to the universe as you do answers to who you are, because people read the same book, and they will come up. Totally out... different message, yeah. Exactly, and some people will find an excuse to cause harm, and others will find an excuse to do kind and beautiful acts. So for me, if I were to read a holy book, I probably wouldn't. I wouldn't expect to find as many answers about the world as I would about myself, because、um, there are so many ways to interpret that information. And come away with. There are so many different understandings of the world、um, to come away with it. That really, you, I, I see more of who someone is、um, from what they take from from holy book than I see changes and shifts in my understanding of the, of the universe.、Mm-hmm. So for, for me, like, I don't see religion as good or bad. I see people's relationships with religion as good or bad. It's like drugs. I don't see drugs as good or bad. You can use them to cure people, or you can use them to completely destroy people's minds. I don't think it's、um, that drugs are good or bad. It's our relationship with them, right? Yeah, I think that's how that's how I would view most things:、um, games, gambling, whatever. Like you can use things in good ways or bad ways. I think that.、Um... I think that it's nice if if you if you really want. I don't think there's anything wrong with using like spirituality or religion to inform your worldview. When you start using it to replace like other like reasonable faculty, then you run it. That's where like the huge problems come in. You know? Yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to get to here is like,、um, if I were to try and understand a god, like even if there were clues and even if there was information about a god that did genuinely exist in a holy book, I think that. I would start with data about the nature of the universe,、mm-hmm. and then move on to the theistic part of it, because the holy books on their own, it's really difficult to measure. Like, how do you know like one religion's interpretation of a god is more valid than another when all of、oh. them lie on a book? Yeah, there's like there's a really old. I used to be very edgy atheist, but there's a really old edgy atheist meme, where I think there's like. There's like a chart, and it's got like 150 religions on it, and like every single one is crossed out except for Christianity. And I don't. I think the quote is something like,、um, "Fuck!" It's like when it's like when you understand why you've dismissed every other religion, you'll understand why I've dismissed yours, or something. It's like some really edgy atheist, but it's like it's kind of like the same thing, right? Like everybody, everybody has. There's like a million religions, but all of them are wrong except for your one religion. It's like, well, what are the chances of that? Rather than maybe just they're all wrong or something, something like that.、Yeah. Yeah, but like, even though I completely understand that perspective,、mm-hmm. I don't look down on religion at all. In sure, fact, I completely、yeah. respect it. I think a lot of good has come out of humanity、um, because of like people using religion as an excuse to help each other. Like, there are loads of cherries that have been born of religion. There are loads of people who've helped homeless because of religion. Like, there are like whole aspects of religion that are dedicated to like altruism and kindness. So like I kind of respect that people can have faith in something, and I think that's beautiful.、Mm-hmm. Um, so like I I don't I I've really turned away like even though I'm not particularly religious myself I've I'm really not attracted to like this hardcore atheist、um, I don't know like anti theism kind of atheism where it's like.、Um, Where they they feel like I'm right, everybody else is wrong. Like religion is ludicrous kind of perspective. Like I feel really pushed back by that, despite the fact that I I understand where it comes from. I don't know. Why did you walk away from that kind of philosophy? Because it sounds you said I used to. What stopped you? <laughs> I used to be like anti-theistic, or yeah. Um, just a lot of. Just a lot of, th- a lot of thinking about things.、Um, I guess like, yeah, you you obviously you know Dr. K. You've referenced him, right?、Um, 
so one of the things that I talk about when it comes to religion is that like, ah, um, oh, fuck, there's like 50 different fucking things to lead into this topic. So I don't think that, so I don't believe that like, um, have you ever heard of the difference like Plato's forms? Like there's like a universal form and versus like a particular form. Have you ever heard of this concept before? No. Um, so like, the, basically there's like, there can be like an idealized form of something, like a like a like an idealized form, like the form of a chair. Um, there can be particulars, uh, like so, like individual types of chairs or whatever. But there's some like concept of like what a chair is, right? Does that make sense? Um, I don't believe that. Like, I don't believe that those universal things are like real, like that. That's like an actual thing. Um, but rather, like we have kind of these concepts as people that map on to real things. So for instance, like like when push comes to shove, I don't think there are such things as trees, right? There's like, there's collections of matter that, you know, work together in a certain way and like how this is grouped and everything. We've decided we draw like these borders, like this thing is a tree um, or like, so, or like this thing is um, like the categories don't exist and, and even really like the individual things themselves don't exist. Like all matter just like exists, but then we kind of like draw these lines around like what we call like what thing. Does that make sense? Like that, that kind of idea? Um, wait, did you say yes? Your mic didn't pick that up. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So when I look at like religious things, um, I try to view them the same way as I would any other category. So sometimes people will um, like look at Dr. K and it's like, oh, like he uses a lot of like, uh, like Buddhist stuff um, when he talks about, uh, when, when he talks about like uh, things related to therapy or mental health or whatever. And the way that I try to explain these things for people that don't have a big spirituality kick or aren't into that kind of stuff is I try to say like, well, don't look at it as like, him talking about like Buddhist spirituality, try to think of it as like, these are concepts that probably map on to some part of the human experience. And mm -hmm. that's kind of how I view religion. So like when somebody tells me that there's like some like, there, there's like a 10 commandments, God tells us not to kill, God tells us not to covet thy neighbor's possessions or whatever, right? Like, I, I don't think that those things are real, but the desires to have people do those things, probably like those things are probably real. It probably maps on to something in the real world. Um, so when I started to look at things like religion or spirituality through like those lenses, I, I get like a little bit less critical of it, as long as they're not like substituting their like faculty for rational thinking by spooky spiritual stupid shit. So like, you know, I'm gonna like never give my kid medical treatment because of some crazy shit I read. Um, I, I usually am a little bit softer on people with religious interpretations of the world. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. I kind of feel like as well, um, we are always, we always perpetually have the capacity to be wrong. Mm -hmm. So I'm never going to assume that I'm categorically right. Um, everyone has experiences and everyone has like access to something that I don't in terms of knowledge and data and life experience, whatever. Right. Uh -huh. So yeah, I feel like I can't reliably say everyone else is wrong just because I believe this and I'm open to how other people interpret the world. I don't have any contempt for other people in their faith. Um, and I still feel like there's a lot to be learned from listening to people of the past and a lot of old holy books and stuff are just like rich with historical references and things. There's still wisdom mm -hmm. to be gained from something that you don't completely agree with. So yeah, that's that part is actually I think the most important part is that when you when you write everything off, you're, you're missing like some part, there might be a, like a reference there that might be true, you know? Um, like it might be the fact that um, that like every religion has like some arbitrary stupid rule, but there might be a reason why that rule exists and it might be worth investigating, you know? Like maybe there's a reason why so many religions said like don't eat pork, you know, maybe back then it was, you know, hard to keep that stuff poisoned or, or unpoisoned or, or like, you know, fresh or something. Or maybe there's a reason why everything says you have to respect your mother and father because in societies where we hate our parents, they fall apart, you know? Like, it, there, there might be some wisdom to be gained from people that have like alternative systems of belief. You don't necessarily have to absorb their whole system of belief to try to learn something from from that like way of thinking, yeah? Exactly. I, I think it's really nice to hear that sort of thing and to hear people be open and respectful and to gain wisdom from things and not entirely write them off that, and to not have like an all or nothing perspective on literally everything including religion like one of the hardest things about being a streamer is um people ask me if i believe in god mm -hmm. and i want to be honest with them and i'm like no i don't i don't presently believe in a god mm -hmm. there are situations where i can understand how a god might come about i have not seen any evidence that that's actually happened um so people immediately like 
as soon as they think they understand my perspective, assume that I hate religion, don't agree with the religion, see no value in religion, and start slandering religion. And I actually have to stop my chat from bundling on religious people and going, ha, and being like openly anti-religion. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, I don't know how to navigate those situations at all. I don't know how to stop people from immediately, as soon as they understand that I don't presently have any kind of religion, immediately taking it as an opportunity to openly shit on people who are religious, because I don't want that, I don't agree with that, I don't like that, and I don't like the assumption that I'm just gonna approve of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think that's really toxic, I think you have to push back on that when you see it. Uh, something that, um, we've talked about this a lot over the past couple of years, but like, something that I think is really important is I don't like theology at all. Um, I, I really just, I don't like the idea of like gods and all that. I think it's a little silly, but I think that there's like a lot of value in the entire package of their like being religion. And I think that like we kind of discarded the whole package of religion when really we just needed to get rid of the theology part. So we lost a lot of the rituals that kind of went along with religious ceremony. So like rites of passage, when you turn a certain age, uh, community gatherings every single weekend, um, doing charity with like groups of people that are like-minded, um, you know, ways to meet strangers and make friends and come together and talk about like how we should live in society. Like I think that all of those things are fine. Um, I just don't like the religious part of it, the theological part of it. But um, when we got rid of like, when people became like a religious and started to lose that, we like completely abdicated all those other things as well, which I think is probably to the detriment of society. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I do think there are other sources of a sense of connection and community. Um, yeah, but none that have like, none of them that were as popular because religion was kind of forced on everybody. I don't think anything has replaced that like gaping hole that like, at least not for me, I can't think of anything that's as similar as like going to church on Sunday and like seeing a whole community full of people you know, listening to some guy give you some like life lesson, like hanging out afterwards, maybe running around with some kids and playing. Like I can't think of anything that's replaced that type of gathering as ubiquitously in society. Mm. Or at least not in the I US. I think I think some of what makes that appealing though is physiological. Like we, as primates, have certain things that induce certain behaviors in us. Um, and the thing is, as well as it having having strengths, it also has weaknesses, mm -hmm. um, which is unfortunate. So on the one hand, you can use religious practices and connections in order to build society up and create order and create like some level of safety and things like this. But you can also use it in a way that makes us prey to fanaticism or sets us back scientifically for a few hundred years because we like burnt all the scientists that invented like an explanation for rainbows or whatever so like it's it's a double-edged sword and it can go either way really really quickly um so while there is virtue i completely agree with you like that that it's a very popular way to create a sense of community and to really establish some really positive behavioral patterns in society um I feel like one of the reasons why it's so inconsistent and it ebbs and flows and why so many of the old gods died um, is because it's inconsistent um, and we haven't really found a system or religion or social construct at all that's consistent and prevailing enough to be overwhelmingly positive. It's just as much a double-edged sword as any other means of social order mm -hmm. that we found. Um, so I still feel like well, it has its virtue. I'm not sure at this point in my life, in my understanding of history, we can argue that it has more virtue than any other form of social order. Yeah, but like that goes back to something we talked about really close to the beginning of this conversation, is that people can't seem to be able to like dissect or analyze something and find the parts of it that are good and then get rid of the parts of it that are bad. It feels like people have to be like all or nothing sometimes. Um, so for instance, like sometimes you might find when it comes to like gender roles, right? You might find like a traditional woman or a traditional man that wants to live like a tra traditional lifestyle. Like some people might not like that. Some people look at it and say like, oh, well, I don't want to do that. This is dumb. But they can't like, they can't help themselves from like, castigating people that do it or demonizing people that do it. It's like, well, hold on. Like, you know, just because you, or maybe somebody like doesn't want to prescribe like all these generals. So they start throwing out everything, right? I want to be a non-binary. I'm not going to wear any pretty dresses. I'm not going to wear any like cool suits. I'm not going to do any of that. Cause that's like a normal general. So you like, you dump everything instead of being, instead of something being like, kind of like a way to free yourself from maybe some prior prescription. Instead, you've like locked yourself in this whole new prison where you're not allowed to have any of the same things that you had in your last room, um, which is kind of sad. Yeah, people like dump everything and they won't like think of like, well, what worked and what didn't work and maybe we keep the things that did work. Yeah, although I feel like I'm really glad you brought that up because I grew out of that. Um, when I was younger, 
I remember Hitchhike. instantly recognizing that the anything feminine was looked down upon. I must have been like somewhere around four, five, six, and I noticed that if you did anything girly, it was considered lesser, and yeah. it was con- people had a contemptuous view of it and took it less seriously. Mm-hmm. So from that perspective, I didn't want to be associated with it, and I thought it was inherently negative because I didn't want to be treated the way that other people who liked pink girly things or did girly things were treated, right? Mm-hmm. So I had to grow out of the idea that it was inherently lesser or wrong to like pink and feminine things. Um, because I had seen it be treated as a thing that's taken less seriously and less valued in society, and I didn't want to be less valued. I mm-hmm. remember recognizing that. Surely, if we can outgrow that, then it's there's the potential for literally anyone from any social contract, no matter what it is, to shed that aspect, notice it on their own, and kind of see the virtue in diversity. Mm-hmm. Surely. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I... <laughs> So, so something that's like very hard um i feel like at some point we were pushing for more open categories for how we organized ourselves and i feel like instead of opening up more categories or instead of opening up the categories it felt like instead we needed to like hyper prescribe like 50 million more categories so like with the way that I, like my engagement with my gender and the way that I've heard other people describe their engagement with their gender, I would consider myself to be non-binary. Like, me being a male isn't really that important to me. It's not really a big, I don't think it's a big part of my personality. It's not that I think about myself. I don't really care that much. Um, mm. But rather than like having a classification in society for like non-binary, I sometimes I wish like well maybe like the category of like male could just be opened up to include that thought like I don't know if that's like that big of a deal um maybe that maybe it's the case that I'm not truly non-binary and like deep inside me there is some part of me that's like you know it's really important actually that I'm a man that's like actually it's the center point to my personality but like it seems like it would almost feel better to where it's like oh you know like sometimes people just don't have this super strong engagement with their gender or it exists on a, on a spectrum right like there some girls are like very 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 girly and enjoy that experience they like like wearing dresses and like doing like cooking and like cute things and blah 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 like they have that engagement which is fine and then you've got like other girls that are like full-on like Tom boys like they like you know car stuff and video games and they don't care about what their nails look like and like they're they're very like uh we'd say like stereotypically masculine it feels like it would be cool if like the categories were open enough to include all those people rather than like oh okay well hold on you're a non-binary you're a cis male you're a femboy you're a tomboy um you're a drag queen but you're a trans drag queen so trans woman drag queen and you're the like it feels like instead we made like 700 different ways to classify people instead of just like kind of like blowing up some of the categories and making them more inclusive to other things and i sometimes i think that bothers me a little bit i can understand that i mean uh if you want to engage with your uh viewers and talk about the whole racist thing i can I can dip out if I'm holding you, because um, I can see that you've gotten like the whole the the tab up there, and it looks really interesting. So oh, it's absolutely know. not. I'm not. They're talking about whether they should make an all white panel. That's bait for me, hardcore. I'm not. <laughs> I don't need that in my life right now. <laughs> okay. Um. So yeah, like the way I see it is sometimes. We have this whole discussion about labels, right? Mm -hmm. And the way I see it is where it becomes most relevant to me is with demisexuality. Some Mm -hmm. people think that it's a label invented by people who want to feel special. And the most common thing that I get in response to me saying demisexuality is, that's just normal. That's how women are, okay? Women Mm -hmm. just aren't attracted to anyone and they prefer an emotional connection. And you're just a normal woman. Shut up. Stop trying to feel special. And it's like... Gotcha. This is me 100%, by the way. So we can argue about this. I'm so curious. Go ahead. Not quite that brutal, but yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, sure. I'm happy to have that conversation with you. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you can ask me anything. You can put that forward if you want and we can have that discussion. (laughs) Yeah, the way I guess like when I think of, um, do you view your demisexuality as a subsection of asexuality or no? So the way I see it is between asexuality and normal, like the typical expected sexuality. Okay, gotcha. I am like the waypoint between the two. Okay, gotcha. Because there, there are some people that like will view demisexuality as like a subsection of asexuality. I know there are different ways that people kind of 
label themselves demisexual, call themselves demisexual. So I guess when I look at something like demisexual, that's also something that I feel like that could fit on a spectrum. Um, so there are, admittedly it's normally women, but I mean, it could be men too. I, I don't fuck as many men as women, so I just don't know as, the sexual habits, I guess, of as many men. Um, it feels like you can place people on really big spectrums in terms of their engagement with sex. This took me a long time to figure out. So like there are, so, um, I, so I'm, if I've been in a relationship with somebody, chances are I'm like very sexually attracted to them um, because we've been with each other sexually a lot. We know our bodies a lot. Like I just, I have that high level sexual attraction. But something that took me so long to figure out is like, there will be people that I am dating for long periods of times, will be very sexually active, will have very good sexual experiences. But then once we're out of the relationship, that person's sexual attraction is absolutely gone. And I don't understand it. Even if I don't like the person that much anymore, I'm like, damn, like, well, hold on. Like we still had like, it was like really good sexually, right? And something that took me a long time to figure out when talking to people is that for some people, a large amount of their sexual attraction towards somebody is baked into like either an ongoing relationship or like their kind of like emotional attachment to that person or like where they view that person in their life, like what headspace they occupy kind of. And there are people that are just like on varying lines of that. And I guess when I think of demisexual, I think of them as being like really far down that, li not like down or up like it's better worse, but they're like really far down the line of like, they need like a pretty big emotional attachment before they have any type of sexual buy-in to a person. Whereas some people might need like somewhat of a sexual or somewhat of like an emotional buy-in to feel some attachment. And some people like me need no like emotional attachment to feel like a sexual buy-in or whatever. And, that, and that's kind of how I, where I view like demisexuality, I guess. I, I, yeah, so mm -hmm. what do you want me to? Or I guess, I, what, what is your, do you like disagree with a part of that or how do you view it? Do you view it in a way that's different than that or? The way I view it is like, I feel that, I feel like I do differ from other people and my experience of sexuality differs from most other men and women, mm -hmm. typically. And um, where it differs specifically is that I am mostly asexual. I don't feel anything. I look at a body, I'm completely indifferent. Mm -hmm. I don't have a reaction to gore and I don't have a reaction to sexual imagery nothing happens like if you were to there are devices that record arousal if you were to show me a bunch of sexual imagery no matter what it was my body's just not going to respond mm -hmm. i feel yeah. indifferent to bodies um in isolation so i'm not going to be able to fap over porn i never had any high school crushes and shit like that i never had like a boy band that i would like fap over as like a teen or whatever like there was nothing for me mm -hmm. um my sexuality can't be switched on at my convenience by browsing through sexual imagery. Sure. Imagery is something that I can't partake in whatsoever. Um, however, I can feel physical attraction and I can feel sexually attracted to people, but usually it, it takes its course. Like I am familiar with a person, I'm friends with them. I will enjoy their company. And what happens, what activates sexuality for me is a grouping of several different experiences that culminate as a sexual response. It's the sound of someone's voice, the way they shake their hair, the way that they speak, the words that they choose, the way that they smell, the clothes that they choose, the like everything that's specific to them becomes sexualized over time because it is a combination of familiar, safe, um, I have a lot of positive emotions associated with it, that sort of thing. I can't exactly quantify it exactly, and that's why it's very unpredictable, and its onset is very sudden. Mm -hmm. And that's a very confusing and different experience to what other people experience sexually. So they go, oh, I'm attracted to that person physically, I would like to get to know their personality, I will try to convince them to go on a date with me so we can get to know each other better, and I can convince them to have sex with me, and maybe we can do that on a regular basis and be in a relationship. It's my understanding of like normal sexuality. Like People understand whether or not they're attracted to someone pretty much instantaneously, Whereas this is something that will happen to me down the line of a friendship, maybe, mm -hmm. in some rare, exce rare exceptional circumstances. Um, and this means that whilst other people might know they're attracted to me straight away, I will not know for a long period of time. And it's not fair to say to someone, I don't know if I like you, can we hang out for a few years and then maybe I'll be attracted to you someday and you can just stay single until I know? Because that's not fair. And there's much a uh, good likely it's going to turn out well for the person who's interested in me because the 99% of the time I'm not interested in them. Mm -hmm. So like that means that most of the time when someone's trying to interact with me in a sexual way, 
It's going to be disappointing, confusing, and completely mismatched in its expectations. It puts a tremendous amount of pressure on me to figure out very quickly whether or not I'm attracted to them, whether when that's not something that's actually possible for me. Um, so like, this means that my experience of sexuality and how it develops is completely uh, just not compatible with how other people do. Um, and this makes it very difficult to date, very difficult to get into a relationship, all of it. Mm -hmm. And that acknowledgement of the name of it and what induces my sexual attraction allows me to relate to, seek, seek advice from, and connect with other people with a mutual experience of that, mm -hmm. to know that I'm not the only person who experiences that, um, and to... Um, and that is tremendously helpful to me, to know that I'm not the only one, that there's not something wrong with me, that I don't need to be fixed, that it's not some hormonal issue or low libido, that this is just a pair bonding style that occurs in some humans and is normal and okay, and that people manage to have relationships in that circumstance is really good and totally transformative for my life. The minute I knew there was a word for it, I knew that I didn't have something wrong with me and that there was a way to have fulfilling relationships. Other people were doing it. There was a, you know, like that allowed me to have a much better relationship with my sexuality and actually be able to have relationships and stuff. So that, that word was helpful to me mm -hmm. and it wasn't a way to feel special because most of the time people just judge me and are very highly contemptuous of it and think, really stupid things of me mm -hmm. but the way that it was helpful was to connect with others who also feel the same way navigate relationships the same way if not to date them because i've never dated another demisexual but just simply to gather data understand myself and find better ways to be respectful of others while i navigate my life and my sex life and stuff how do you um when you look at some aspect of yourself how do you decide if it's something that you should accept and embrace versus something that you ought to change. I've never asked myself that in relation to my sexuality and mm -hmm. I guess my first question before I answer that is why would you ask that in relation to the demisexuality? sexuality? So there's two examples that I can think of. So for myself, I am an incredibly cold and emotionally detached person for the majority of my life. It's just the kind of person I am. Um, and I talked about this a bit with Dr. K, and I've thought about this a lot in my own time, and I've kind of wondered, like, is that okay, or should I change it? And I don't really have like a, like, I'm happy. I'm pretty happy. It's not like I'm miserable every day. Um, so for, for like an emotional side, there's that thing. From a sexual side, um, I was like, I guess like straight up until I literally was like 29 or 30 years old. And I was like, would it really be so bad to like mess around with a guy? And I kind of thought about it for a while. I was like, you know, probably not. And that's kind of how I explored like my bisexual or pansexual side. It literally just came from like some like internal dialogue. And I was like, ah, eh, fuck it. Like, let's try it. Like, I don't know if I like, maybe I am not straight or maybe I can go be bi or pan or whatever. Um, and th that str sprung from that. Um, so it sounds, I guess when I ask you that question, it sounds a little accusatory, like, how do you know you're not broken? Um, but I'm, I'm just genuinely curious in terms of like your relationship with your, or your engagement with your demisexuality. Like, have, do you ever think like, this is something bad that needs to change? Or are you like, well, I understand this is a concept now. I think this is a fine part of myself. I don't like care to change it. I don't need to. Like, how do you decide, or do you have a way by which you decide if there's like some characteristic of yourself that needs to change? Or if you just need to accept it and like be happy with it and move on? I guess that's kind of what I'm asking. I have a dick. I don't have a dick. Mm -hmm. um, so basically for me, uh, for me, uh, I did wonder if there was something wrong with me before I knew there was a word for it, mm -hmm. because I didn't know anyone else felt the same way. So sure. I was like, is this a symptom of something physiological? Like, I don't know anyone else who's like this. Mm -hmm. Is is this like a low libido? Has something happened to me? Um, is this like, do, do I change my diet or something? Like, what's happened? Is this a result of trauma? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Um, but then like, I, when I found a word for it and like other people who felt the same way, I was like, well, this seems to be something that other people have experienced and they're having healthy, happy relationships. You know, they're feeling attraction, they're finding ways to function. This isn't like um, something that seems to be influenced by some, some inherent flaw. Mm -hmm. It's it, it, it kind of normalized it for me and okay. gave me another scope. I started to look for other answers than that. Um, so like, I did wonder what, whether or not it was a flaw until I understood that like other people experienced it too. Um, and then when I did, I listened to them and their experiences because like, I had a therapist who said, well, maybe if you've had like lots of people breach your trust, maybe you just need to know they're safe before you um, consider yourself open to or acknowledge your sexual feelings or whatever, but I don't think it's that at all. Mm -hmm. um, 
so for me like i don't think it's something that needs to be fixed it can be challenging um but i don't think i could fix it if i tried because mm -hmm. it's something that i feel was inherent i was born this way um yeah, so, to be like, clear, I'm not saying that, like, you should fix it or whatever. I was just curious if you have, like, some way of, like, validating, like, this is an okay thing and this needs to change. Because that, because so, so much of my experience, like, day to day is, it seems to be, like, pretty atypical. Um, and obviously, externally, and I'm sure it's actually the exact same for you. I'm sure there's a lot of people that tell you that, like, you're not demisex. You, well, you've said it, right? You're not demisex. You're just traumatized. Like, you're just, you've got problems that you need to fix. And I, a lot of people say the same about me in terms of, like, my engagement with the world. And, yeah, it seems really hard sometimes to uh, validate, like, what parts of you are okay and can be that way versus like well maybe you should try to change this or i should try to change this or somebody should try to change this. yeah i was curious if that's like something you've engaged with a lot well the way uh, i guess the best analogy i can give you is from my adhd mm -hmm. like uh when i was raised in a world where which is suited to people who don't have adhd who have brains that are organized and interpret data a specific way i thought i was flawed mm -hmm. but then I, so I constantly kept trying to fix my sleeping pattern. I constantly kept trying to learn and behave and interact in the way that everybody else does. And I kept mm -hmm. failing. And I wasn't ever going to be as good at it as everyone else who's suited to that way of living is. And I was never ever going to be myself. Mm -hmm. But So I developed a new philosophy. The way that I naturally inherently behave is what I try to make work. It's an opportunity. So if I can't help but do something, I'll find a way to make that a positive. Mm -hmm. So with my demisexuality, I've started to acknowledge the aspects that make it very advantageous. Like I'm very loyal and um, my sense of attraction grows over time. It doesn't diminish. Mm -hmm. And at the moment that's kind of heartbreaking because most people, um, they develop, like they grow accustomed to their partners and like the lust stage fades and they become very used to their partner. Whereas I get more and more excited by someone, the more I know them and the more familiar I am with them, the more the emotional connection, the more attraction, right? Mm -hmm. But it means I'm very safe, very loyal. I've always been trusted, not single ever. I've never had a partner who was worried that I would cheat on them. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know I have a lot of security to offer someone if I do bring them into my life. And I think that's a really rare thing. That level of stabil stability and security is a very rare thing to bring to the table. So there are advantages and there is an attractive element of being demisexual. So I don't necessarily think it's a disadvantage because I don't have to try to be a safe, loyal partner. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to convince someone over time that I'm not gonna hurt them. So like, I think that that's like, just, I've shifted my perspective on, on the things that make me different instead of making it being a flaw that I need to adjust because it's challenging. Like mm -hmm. how, how, like for me, being able to be attracted to someone is a form of intimacy, but for everyone else, it's just the default. They're capable of being, of being attracted to other people than their partner, but they'll stay loyal to their partner for their partner's feelings. Like that's a very common thing. Yeah. Um, but for me to work up to even physical attraction, that attraction is a form of intimacy. To know that someone can be that intimate with other people very easily and it's not special is a very hard thing to process and understand as someone who's never felt casual attraction. And it's scary. So like to not have that level of security, safety, and all that reciprocated in a monogamous relationship is terrifying. And it doesn't feel very even. It doesn't feel like an equal relationship when you're offering more loyalty and safety than the other person. Um, so, yeah, I could see how it could be interpreted as a flaw, but I'm happy that I'm demisexual and I'm not trying to fix it because I kind of already inherently know I'm not going to be able to fix it or change it even if I tried. Mm -hmm. um, there's no way for me to magically f switch on aesthetic attraction. Mm -hmm. um, but even if I could, I don't think I'd desire to because I see the pros of it now and the rare advantages to being how I am. So I'm going to just stick with doing what I can't help but do. Because people with ADHD are several times more likely to successfully run their own business. They, um, they have advantages if they're allowed to indulge and capitalize on the way their brain does work instead of fixating on the parts that don't behave typically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I think that, um, I think I'm pretty similar in that I'll try to find out, like, basically, like, is some part of me inhibiting my ability to lead a happy, healthy life? If it is, then I probably need to do everything I can to change it. But if there's some way that you can, like, kind of 
make it work um, and then like take advantage of it, then it's probably not a thing that needs to be changed. You can just kind of like work with it. Yeah. So I've had two six-year relationships, one after the other. That's mm -hmm. 12 years of relationships consecutively. Um, I think it's very challenging for some people to be able to achieve that. I, I, I put it down to my demisexuality that I was able to do that so early um, in my life. So yeah, I, I don't interpret it as a negative. It's just another way of loving and it doesn't stop me from being able to love or seek fulfillment from love. So why would I change it? I mean, I, I do wish that I could feel aesthetic attraction. Mm -hmm. It does sound pretty cool to be able to just be instantly horny just because. Like to go, I feel like being horny, I'm gonna go watch porn, now I'm horny, yay. That sounds like a really cool thing to have just instant access to your sexuality. That's mm -hmm. something I don't have. But I think that seeing it as a flaw won't spontaneously give me that thing. Yeah, for so, sure. It would either require mm -hmm. a lot of like mental work, and maybe that's just not a possible thing to turn on, yeah? Because it seems like so much of our sexual attraction is kind of like natively given to us. Like what, like, is there really anything sexually attractive about a boob? Like, if you really think about it, like, it's just, but for some reason, like, your brain is, like, wired in such a way that it's like, oh, booba, you know, or, or the shapes of bodies or whatever, like, it just is what it is, yeah. So, like, I, I think the thing that bothers me the most is that people think it's just female sexuality. That that's just how women are. They're lying to themselves. It's such a douche thing to think of women. Okay, so like nobody's ever seen what a Justin Bieber concert. Like people, women, people don't think that women can't be shallow. They're like more sexually selective than men because they have to be because they're, it takes more resources to produce offspring. Of course, they have to choose carefully. Of course, that's stimulated by signifiers of physical health. For fuck's sake. Of course, women can be shallow. That's so stupid. And like, people are like, oh no, you're not demisexual, you're just a woman. When I've been surrounded by horny, shallow women who've been aesthetically attracted to people they don't know my entire life, and I'm like, how do you not know this? How have you not seen a woman be physically attracted to someone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, how? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, there's a lot of dumb stuff that people say, but yeah. Yeah, so, I don't know. For me, I think that's just the challenging thing of demisexuality. I'm not saying, I, there is no feeling special. I think it takes like a certain amount of acknowledgement that you're going to be judged and people are going to assume that you just want to feel special. Like you don't get to feel special as a demisexual. You just get to feel doubted. Mm -hmm. People think that you invent that to feel special. You don't get to feel special. People just give you shit for it. But the reason think, I acknowledge- Here's something I'm curious. Do you mm -hmm. think that there are people that wear the tag um, because they want to feel special? Or do you think you've ever ran into somebody like that before? Oh yeah, 100%. Um, so one of my experiences was, I was like, okay, I've discovered this new world and there are other people who are demisexual too. That's mm -hmm. incredible. Okay. I'm not alone. I'm not broken. What's mm -hmm. going on? So I found like Facebook groups and all sorts of things. Um, groups of people congregating who fall under that label. You want to know something really weird? A lot of people who identify as demisexual are outlandishly attractive. I found it so intimidating. I was like, uh, I don't belong here. Uh, um, because they were all supermodels. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. um, so what would quite often happen is loads of people would see these super hot people and they'd go through their profiles on certain social media and they'd go, sexual, that's their sexuality. I'll relate to them there. I'll show them they want to have sex with me. And they'll pretend to be demisexual having no clue what it is. Mm -hmm just to get close to someone hot on the internet. And you could spot them a mile away. People who want the label, but they watch porn. You can't be demisexual and watch porn. The whole point is you can't feel emotionally connected to someone you don't know. Like sure. if all you've seen is their tits, you're not emotionally connected to them. I'm sorry. Like, look, that's the thing. If it's like something you prefer, that's just normal. So a lot of people who can feel physical attraction and shallow attraction to people they don't know also prefer a connection before they date someone or have sex with them. Mm -hmm. That's that's a very average thing to feel. The demisexual is the absence of an ability to feel physical attraction and to have a sexuality based on a long-term, or some sort of emotional connection, some sort of actual non-physical thing. Um, and so quite a lot of people will misinterpret it, but try to have the label to get close to someone who has the label. Um, so yes, I've seen people deliberately stretch the truth or people want the label even though it doesn't apply to them people want to feel special or virtuous all that stuff i've seen it mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that that's what it's for 
like, there are people who use religion to persecute gay people, but that's not what religion's for. Like, there are people who are incels, identify as incels, and they just want to talk to other people who are also sad about not being chosen by someone yet. Not, like, angry, actively angry at the opposite sex for not choosing them. Like, there are people who will go and, you know, do something horrible and commit an act of terrorism because no woman slept with them. And that doesn't mean that that's what the term is for. And I'm kind of tired of people immediately assuming that demisexual, uh, demisexuality is a term that people unanimously use to feel special just because some people have abused it that way. Sure. Okay, makes sense. Mm. So, yeah, like, I, I, I know that there are some people out there who abuse the term. But that's applicable about literally fucking everything. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't invali invalidate any actual factual aspect of any term in the human language. So I just, um, I, I, yeah. The reason why it's an important term to me is because a lot of people, I have this issue where I make friends with people and they try to date me. I thought that making friends with straight women would spare me. It didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so... I have to explain to them, like, I don't know whether I'm attracted to you or not, how could I? Like, my sexuality doesn't work like that. One day I will spontaneously be attracted to someone I'm vaguely connected to you in some way or another, and it will be annoying because I've not shown any interest in them before, so coming out with those feelings is going to be very random and difficult, and that's unfortunately the reality I deal with. And I'm scared to tell people because they think that they just have to play the long game and wait for me to be attracted to them, which is even more devastating, because someone will spend three years obsessing over me and trying to make me attracted to them, and then it doesn't work out. Yeah. So <laughs> Basically, the, the way that your mind is scared, just you completely, it doesn't work with the normal, like, kind of like... I'll say mating rituals or whatever, or kind of like the dance that you do to figure out if somebody's attracted to somebody and then to progress into a relationship. It te act technically actually it feeds into some, as you're saying, like really harmful stereotypes where like, well, maybe people just friend you really hard, eventually that switch will flip, which probably leads to a lot of bad situations, I imagine. Uh-huh. I mean, I've been relatively lucky in that um, I've not been turned down because when I've suddenly realized I've had feelings for someone, I've just gone, hey, I have feelings for you. And they're like, awesome. And then we're in a relationship. And, you know, they, they've usually been people who are into me anyway. Um, so it's always usually worked out. I can only think of like one instance where it wasn't reciprocated and I never even brought it up. I never asked them out. I was just like, that person's in a relationship. I'm not going to pursue it. Done. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I never said anything. So. I've not been turned down, um, but the thing is, like, I've had to turn down so many people and it's awkward and horrible and a lot of guys just befriend me waiting for me to suddenly be attracted to them and it doesn't happen and they get angry at me and then stop being friends with me after six years and that's such a mindfuck. Yeah. So yeah, it's not something I'm doing to feel special, it's a really hard thing to navigate in a world geared towards dating. Um, so. I, I can't stress enough how much of a negative stereotype it is and how worrying it is to explain to people because they're not gonna usually they never really receive it well yeah or they won't believe you exactly or they'll just think i'm a woman and this is normal and this is how women are because mm -hmm. they've never seen a woman experience physical attraction which is kind of tragic especially if they're a dude sure so yeah that's that's the standpoint i have with it it's like I don't think I live in a society that really is open to the idea of a human not feeling physical attraction. It's not something people ever empathize with. I mean, I can feel physical attraction, but not like just aesthetic physical attraction. Like, mm -hmm. I can become attracted to someone's body shape. I can become attracted to some things that define that human, but only because they're specific to them, not because they in themselves are stimulating on their own. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> that was such a long-winded explanation. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think I have a decent understanding. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, I, it, it comes with its challenges and it's very frustrating. And I'm probably going to spend multiple years alone because I know that I've not really ever slept with or dated anyone that I've known for less than a year. Mm -hmm. So if I'm presently sat here and I can think of all the people I've known in that time period and I'm not attracted to them, I'm like, oh 
guess it's going to be another few years before I know whether I'm attracted to anyone. So I, I can pretty reliably say, yeah, probably going to be single for a while. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Does that change anything about your perception? <clears throat> um... I think I still view it on a spectrum, but I, I, I'm, I'm more sympathetic towards like how downstream the spectrum it, it would be, I guess, in terms of like feeling sexual attraction towards somebody. Um, but I mean, like, I, I can respect the struggle um, in terms of how you feel the sexual attraction, because the way that you would engage with relationships for a lot of people would probably feel pretty toxic on their end, where they're kind of like, they have this idea that if they wait around long enough, eventually some switch will flip and they can like, you know, it's, it's for, for somebody that wasn't demisexual, it would be like the um, the actual thing that you're not supposed to do is if you friend somebody hard enough, eventually they'll get attracted to you. Like conventionally, that doesn't work because most people make very quick uh, decisions on whether or not they're like see somebody like in a sexual box or a non-sexual box. So for somebody to remain truly undecided for long periods of time is a very um, foreign experience, I think, to most people. See, this is why I'm envious of like people in your situation where like you can have an open relationship you can be very happy and free and ex acknowledging of like all this different like you have more opportunities to be sexual to feel sexual feelings to connect with people and you're in a relationship which allows for that mm -hmm. I, mean, I just have to go long periods on my own not feeling any like not being able to benefit from that aspect of my the, those spectrums of feelings like that's not an opportunity that happens to me not just because of other people but just because of myself it doesn't activate in myself very reliably i don't have a thing that i know stimulates me i don't have a type that i know i'll be attracted to um i don't have like lots of opportunities to indulge my sexuality in that respect mm -hmm. so like I, I lots of people think it's a virtue and they're like oh that's so cool that's so morally superior and i'm like that's Bullshit! I'm basically cut off to a huge element of human experience that other people get to indulge in really, like, a lot more often than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. Thanks for the chat. It's been interesting. I'll yeah. catch you later. No problem. Fun, bye.